Thanks so much, folks. It's a pleasure to be here. There's something uh, delightfully self-referential about after a day full of presentations, you see someone up here presenting about the presenting. And the origin of the idea came from talking to Bob and Scott and Jennifer here at DTC Perspectives. And there was the feeling that all of you are so busy being experts at what you do. All of you are terrific at what you do, and that's why you're here. And there are opportunities at various points throughout your professional careers to do what many of the speakers have done today. Many of you have been speakers already today. And when that opportunity comes up to give a presentation, it usually is something of a burden, right? You're busy throughout the course of your day. You need to compartmentalize and package your content in a compelling way. And then you need to kind of set yourself up, expose yourself, and really give all that you can give in terms of making that oftentimes very emotional impact to audiences is part of doing what you do. So consider this a value add to the series that DTC Perspectives is offering. It's my pleasure to kind of take you through this. As Jennifer mentioned, there's an opportunity for it to be as interactive as possible. So I would love to cite some examples of presentation opportunities that you have or have coming up. And then we can work it through together in terms of giving it that extra something something. So it's all about really transforming a presentation into what we would consider a performance. Because once again, when you put together content like this, it's not about sharing a deck, it's not about processing written or even digital information, it's about bringing it to life in front of people that could really maximize your career and ultimately bring about the behavioral transformation in the real world that we're always talking about in terms of our print, TV, social media campaigns for DTC. So, once again, it's, this is part two of a series. Yesterday, I conducted a similar workshop where we were primarily focused on content development. Today, we're more focused on translating that content into the actual presentation, but the two are dependent on each other, so we'll probably go back and forth between the two. Jennifer was mentioning, just in terms of my background, I've been in DTC for probably 15, 20 years in every capacity. I've started on the content side. I morphed into media, digital, and technology, strategy, and the like. So I do have creds in terms of knowing what you're dealing with, knowing your audience, and knowing how to convey it. And I'm also a bit of a ham. I kind of like doing this. And they recognize that I have an opportunity to kind of take you through this in a way that we could really add value and hopefully help you along too. So the goal here is to turn a presentation, which is oftentimes tedious not only for the presenter, but also for the audience. If you think about it, there's a really narrow window when we're doing what we're doing right now. We're with clients, we're with colleagues, and it's really kind of a golden opportunity in a rare moment where you can actually be effervescent and convey information and passion in front of a live audience. So why not make the most of it? Turn it into something of a performance for the sake of it being memorable, and if it's memorable, it makes impact, and it's really going to accomplish more of the goal of what you're setting out to do. So I'd like to start out with the idea that we can all probably relate to is, why is presenting usually so difficult? Not only in terms of time and energy that goes into it, but, it, but it's kind of debilitating in a lot of ways, too. There's a lot of upfront stuff, and then in the actual execution, there's usually a lot of trepidation. And in a sense, you're performing. And performance historically has been known as being behind the fourth wall. And the reason it evolved and is defined as the fourth wall, because on a conventional stage, going back to Shakespearean times, going back to Greek times, right? You've got the three walls of the stage, stage left, stage right, backstage, and, and up front. And the fourth wall literally is, is the one that's between the audience and yourself. I got this little gift, you've probably seen it before. And I think the essential problem is a matter of point of view. You might have seen this, I hope you can see it now, it's kind of fun. And this was a live sculpture that was built and put together. And as you walk toward it, it's a three-dimensional object that you three and you see in 2D slices. And it starts with two giraffes, and as you kind of move around it, it's actually an elephant. And I think that's kind of a vivid description of the power of perspective. And the whole art of presenting and preparing a presentation and delivering it 
is being sensitive to the difference in point of view. So let me be more specific. Your audience has certain expectations of you and certain feelings of you that you don't particularly have. And in fact, they're quite the opposite. So your audience expects data, insights, knowledge, mentorship, or obviously communicating information and passion with the goal essentially of bringing about some kind of behavioral change, right? What your audience feels is passivity, they're relaxed. They're distracted, they're expectant, they're bemused, they're kind of passively taking it in. In stark contrast, you expect making connections with people, networking, boosting your career, communicating something of value, and emotionally you're the exact opposite. You're nervous, you're exposed, you're on edge. It doesn't have the qualities usually of an organic one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody, and that sense of distance makes the entire process more difficult. So what could possibly go wrong between these two disparate points of view? And the answer is quite a bit. So we want to break down that fourth wall. And the way to do that is really find a lot of synergy between your content and the way you present and your attitude going into it. And let me describe how. So in terms of really setting yourself up, an important thing to think about is knowing yourself, ultimately, and knowing your audience. Know what your intent is and what you're trying to communicate. But with greatest sensitivity, understand who you're communicating with. It's an analog of what we do in media and communications anyway. It's like knowing the target, identifying it, and relating to them in terms of what they expect and not necessarily but what you want to. So in our case, too, the folks we present to are patients, caregivers, professionals. We've got payer provider audiences. But from a professional vantage point, it's media and colleagues. So kind of to toss out the first question, uh, open it up just a little bit. In terms of your professional careers and what you do, what are the opportunities that you have to present in a live setting with content? and to what kind of audiences. Obviously, several of you presented today to us, <laughs> but what are some contexts, what are some targets, what are some opportunities that you take in terms of reaching out and relating to people in this direct kind of way? Just toss, toss out a few. Yeah, Decision makers in business, so from a pitch and presentation point of view, right? So from the agency side of the house, the art of giving a great pitch really fills the pipeline, really, and is kind of the lifeblood of the organization. So the gravitas behind an actual live presentation is significant for a lot of folks, right? So if you're on the provider side, if you will, from a business development point of view, presentations are central, right? It's a, it's a big chunk of what, of what we do in terms of thought leadership, in terms of sharing. So the audience in that sense is basically the decision maker, like you said, and what they want and how they interact. Uh, thought leadership opportunities, right? When we come up and we actually present in a conference like setting. Any other opportunities? Any other? I'm sorry? Salesforce internally, right, right, right. And then in that sense, you have, you're kind of presenting to presenters, <laughs> right? So the Salesforce is going out there and they're presenting in ways the differentiator of, of your treatments and your products. And then you're kind of coaching them and inspiring them to present. So that adds a new dimension to it. So we have business development opportunities, we have training opportunities where we actually have to present and electrify the audience. Any other opportunities about leadership, business, training, college to college, this kind of thing. So in terms of mindset, it's a good idea to know whom you're presenting to and why, in a basic kind of sense. So the other take, aside from knowing who you are and your goals and who your audience is, is basically the need to practice. I love the uh, four or five Ps, right? Proper preparation prevents poor performance. There's a few other Ps usually tossed in there, too. But uh, it's a matter of knowing your content, being familiar with it, practicing it, and even performing it in the space. So I think this is obvious, but it's oftentimes neglected. We are so content focused in our lives in terms of everything we do, from email, 
presentation building and the like, that the actual opportunity to prevent, present in front of people is usually shoot off to the side and sometimes altogether neglected. So in terms of best practices, it's a great idea. Do it in the mirror, have some key top line ideas, have somebody record you, see what it's like. I know sometimes that's a little scary, right? But once again, all the effort, if you think about the amount of time and effort that goes into creating the deck, is likely 10, 15, 20 times the length of time and effort that you actually do the presentation. And that's skewed slightly in an exaggerated but realistic and, and, and problematic way, right? You want to spend a little bit more time focused on actually relating to the audience to the point where you're comfortable. Where going in, you've got the mental and muscle memory. Know your space. Check it out. If you're going to pitch in front of a group of people and you're familiar with it, you don't always have that luxury. But if you can take that luxury, walking around and checking it out, if you can mingle with the audience a little bit ahead of time, that's helpful. It's about building up your own sense of emotional comfort so that you can be more natural and direct and more immediate, which the audience is, of course, sensitive to. So now we've got that covered in terms of knowing yourself and your goals, knowing your audience and proper preparation. That's kind of an overhanging halo. There's three rules or basic you know, best practices I'd love to quickly take you through and kind of get you involved into the mix. And the first is the importance of making an immediate impact. So in a sense, it's owning the room within the first 10 to 20 seconds. Sustaining an emotional connection, which is a lot different than this is usually looked at, and closing with a memorable call to action. So not walking out with anything ambiguous, but actually looking at folks directly and asking them to do something measurable and concrete, because we can really only remember a few things, and it's a crowded kind of landscape. So let's start with the first one which is oftentimes overlooked, and it has repercussions in terms of not only your audience and their reaction to you, but how you feel as a speaker busting onto a scene. So as a general rule, and this is true in any kind of setting, when somebody takes command and draws attention, you need to own the room in the first 20 seconds. 20 seconds. So the reason that this is significant, the best analog I can think of is the speed dating scene, right? Remember when that was pretty popular? So you have like a minute or two to directly connect. If you look at all the statistics about human interaction, we tend to be biased in the kind of way that first impressions are incredibly powerful and lasting because our brains are kind of designed in this survival mentality of quick decisions. And it's oftentimes very, very difficult to change a person's perceptions after those initial Im impact is made. So when you're when it's not introduced and you're announced, and then you come out with a sense of confidence and you address the room, based on all that analytics about psychological interaction with people and the impact that we make, within the first 20 seconds, maximum a minute, the audience gets into a frame of mind and they've already decided whether they like you or not, whether you have a certain level of credibility, and if you can really make the impact that you want to make. Conversely, on the other side of that mirror, within the first 20 seconds to a minute, if you feel you have that ownership of the room, that in turn engenders a sense of confidence and focus that can really propel the rest of your presentation forward. If within that first 20 seconds to a minute you kind of stumble, or you second guess yourself, or blanch, or start thinking in terms of what you're gonna say and what you're gonna do, it could be problematic for you too, right? Because then it's gonna take a lot of effort to kind of get it back. In terms of a couple of practices, and everyone's different, before I begin a presentation, I have a mental idea as to my opening. The first thing that I'm going to say. So for example, yesterday I gave a talk about chatbots and social media and technology. And I opened it by saying, welcome to the invasion of the robots. And then I got my phone and I had a fake conversation with Siri. 
where I kind of pre-program and text voice in Siri's voice and we're kind of arguing with each other. Some of you might have seen it yesterday. But the reason I did that was to kind of follow this rule that I've learned, which is entertain, empower, and get them to feel comfortable and to like you, which I think is a significant step in the right direction and almost a prerequisite for the rest of your presentation to hold. So as kind of a breakout session, we don't need to be too formal. And, and I know you're kicking back, but if anybody wants to cite an example, so best practices for breaking ice, if I share a personal anecdote, a funny story, timely news, talking to Siri, uh, telling a family story, becoming a human rather than a talking head, any way to make a connection. And once again, the criteria for this to work needs to be relevant, credible, and you need to even show some humility, right? So back to my talk, it was about chatbots and healthcare. So it made sense for my conversation with Siri because voice-activated technology is what's really going to transform healthcare. So it had relevance. It was credible because I delivered it in kind of a fun way. And then lastly, it was humble. So Siri was kind of, you know, giving me a hard time. So I, I tried to make myself human, I tried to make myself engaging and accessible, and I tried to infuse it with a little bit of humor. So as an example, either think of something new or opportunities that you've had or anything cool that you've done to kind of break the ice. Anything anyone would like to share about breaking the ice in a way which is kind of fun or friendly. Any volunteers? No one broke the ice. Let's break the ice together. <laughs> what could be a handful of fun things we can do in terms of ownership of the room or, or grabbing someone's attention? What do you usually do when you begin a presentation and kind of introduce yourself? Any takers? No takers. Okay, so I cited the example yesterday of, of introducing some kind of fun and, and relevant technology. Um, some other ideas that you might want to try are similar ideas that are icebreakers in meetings, too. So interacting with the audience. Here's a couple things, too. Everyone has a smartphone. So I'll share one kind of fun best practice. Everyone has a smartphone, and the smartphone is basically everyone's access to their entire life, right? We order things from our smartphone, we summon a car, we reserve a room. All the cool stuff that we talk about, healthcare and digital, on-demand services and streaming content, you know, our phones are our world. So if you have a phone, you have access to everything personal about you, you can kind of have fun with it. So one icebreaker, you can maybe use at meetings or even in a presentation, especially if you're presenting to a smaller group, is to ask folks to access their smartphone, and there's really funny things that you can do. So one is share your last picture in your photo screen and tell everyone about the context of it. As a presenter, you can maybe even put someone on the spot, preferably someone you know, and ask them to do that and have them describe what the photo is. Another fun thing to do is to look at your text message stream and then quote out of context the last text message that they have. So all of this sounds kind of goofy, but the goal here is to break the ice, get folks to be more comfortable and to open up to whatever else ensues. You calm down, the audience is all of a sudden your friend and so there's a wall of people who are putting you on the spot and judging you. And then it's much, much easier to kind of move forward and have fun. And this is, again, true regardless of the context. If you've got a business pitch going on, um, I know I've done that many times before, which is you ask the potential client to do something that's personal, opening it up with a personal story. What was the last rock concert you attended? What was the last movie you saw? Whatever. Make it personal. Make it kind of fun. And that could have some, some benefit. So, okay, so you own the room in 20 seconds. The next key part of this is making an emotional connection. And I think this is significant and fun is because being experts, especially in healthcare, right? Healthcare is deep. 
It's complicated. You got clinical information that surrounds all of our treatments, right? You've got a healthcare stakeholder ecosystem that involves dozens of experts, each with their own expertise and knowledge, interconnected and all dependent on each other in this huge swirl of information. So whether you're pitching to clients, if you're not trying to train your sales force, there's all this information going around. A lot of it is quantified, a lot of it is very detailed, and it's easy to get lost in the mix of all the details and all the information and everything that you're trying to do. So the thing to keep in mind when you're presenting is that you're not really lecturing. You're not trying to communicate too many of the proof points because people can't take it in in a live kind of setting. At most, you can get folks to remember one, two, three things in a day-long series of presentations like what we had before. When you think about the presenters, you might think about a couple key points that they made. You might think about a funny joke that they said. All of these cues and memes and things that make you remember and want to act are all really emotional and not cognitive, and that's really, really significant. So the essence of it is structuring it into a story. So I liken this to the difference between getting like the instruction manual for a CD player from back in the day, right? It's just printed in 20. Who read those things? Nobody. It's all about the experience of using it. And then if you get a new device, you just kind of press the buttons and try it, right? And you might refer to a few points. But the essence is, is it's experiential and it's not based on detail. It's emotional and it's not really cognitive. Because we're obviously not seeing a video of me up here, it's me up here, and we're making a connection and it's all about maintaining that and enforcing that. So when you craft your presentation, this goes slightly into the content, we covered more of this yesterday, you need to really identify a hero, a villain, a solution, and the results. So in a nutshell, when you're presenting, you're not rattling off a long litany of facts and information, but you're actually sharing a story. And the more you involve your audience in your storytelling and the story progression, and the more you clearly identify the hero in that story that you're trying to, to, to convey, the more you make the villain a real threat, the more drama you infuse into it, the more powerful the value proposition of the solution that you offer, and the more clear your results. So toss it back out if anyone wants to volunteer. Uh, presentation or performance can even cite something that, that happened today. Uh, what's a clear hero that you have used? What was the villain? What was the solution? And then how did you share results? This is kind of a case study situation. Situation, right? Challenge, solution, the result. It's analogous to that, but you kind of bring it to life. Any, any volunteers? Melissa? <laughs> Of the, uh, <laughs> the disease state, right? 
And then here's the screenshots of a website or a plan. How, how did you try to bring that to life?
because we don't have teleprompters, right, like the stand-up late-night comics or politicians. So we oftentimes use the deck as that. But the problem is it creates this dissonance and you lose the opportunity to actually be fabulous. So slides are like billboards instead of a supporting backup or talk track. When you're driving your car down the highway, right? A lot of people spend a, money, a lot of money on ads. And this is kind of the oldest of old school print. <laughs> Even if you're flipping through a magazine, like some of the rules of print, I know there's a lot of print people. And you guys can cite the statistics better than me, but you got like a tenth of a second, a half second to make an impact and have them stick around. So it can't be too dense. It's an emotional connection. The same thing with slides during a presentation. If I can teach you one thing, like the one memorable takeaway, I saw Spitz at DTC, it's kind of fun, blah, blah, blah. This one would be the takeaway. This would be the one memorable moment that I could hopefully convey. And that is, here's what a slide looks like usually. <laughs> I'm not saying it's your slides, but we've all seen them before, and I'm citing kind of an extreme example, so bear with me. History of roller coasters. Notice how all it's long form, right? There's a ton of information on this slide. There's a moment in my presentation where I'm talking about the ups and downs of patient centricity and the application of digital health in wearables, <laughs> whatever. And then all of a sudden it becomes relevant to kind of dive into the history of roller coasters a little bit. There are several explanations for the name roller coaster. It's originated from the American, but it also goes back to different types of slang. In many languages, names were as Russian mountains, Scandinavian languages in German, the figure eight bond, blah, 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 blah. Now, this is obviously an exaggeration, but we see this all the time. So the audience has no idea what's particularly relevant. It is impossible for the audience to get anything meaningful out of this visual, uninflected image, than maybe the title and then a blur of words, okay? Conversely, the opportunity cost here is huge because you're up here using a metaphor of roller coasters, you're connecting with the audience, and all of a sudden they're trying to read your slide. <laughs> Here's the way you could kind of specify the slot. And this is applicable not only to like one portion of your presentation, but it's an attitude and a mentality that can really provide a tremendous amount of value whenever you're presenting content. And it could be helpful whenever you're even offering up content, because at the end of the day, the same rules apply even for leave behind. If you're putting an executive summary together, if you're trying to capture your ideas frame by frame, hero, villain, solution, case studies, and the like. We're visual creatures, we have to think intuitively, and we like to think in terms of frame. So try this, instead of history of roller coasters with a Wikipedia article, try that. <laughs> You see this guy literally flipping out. We've gone from the functional and cognitive, higher level brain functions to the very, very visual and visceral. And once again, this is deliberately an exaggeration. And the only words, I'm limiting myself to four words. I don't care about the origin of the name roller coaster. And I was just talking about patient centricity and the challenge of introducing wearables and the like. And it's really been a roller coaster in terms of the development of mobile health. If I wanted to hit that point in my live presentation, I wanted to convey emotionally to the audience that the history of mobile health has been a roller coaster of ups and downs. I could either share the Wikipedia article to prove that point or I could have pie charts and graphs showing the ups and downs, or I could blast the audience with the emotion of what it means to be on a roller coaster ride with regard to patient engagement and technological development. Now, it seems like an oversimplification, but give it a whirl, because when you're presenting, it's fun. And then if you put together a series or montage of these big images, Rather than wordy, graphically heavy presentations that your audience is trying to struggle through, you might have an easier time of building the deck. 
because it's more like a movie storyboard. And you can have way more fun presenting because instead of being dependent on the points, there's a lot of details and points here, most of, most of which your audience won't remember anyway. And here is the emotional impact of what you're trying to convey, which is the intensity, the uncertainty, the thrills and stills of what this means for you, your audience, and then in a sense the patients that are involved. So here's a little session. Again, you can be shy if you want. How do you emotionalize the side? So I'm going to use an example. Data-driven insights. We talk about that all the time. Kind of a high-level concept, all its variations. What do data-driven insights mean? Well, it's really kind of about optimization. So if you get data-driven insights about your audience, you're kind of optimizing your segmentation and coming to know your audience better. And again, I'm just kind of bullshitting here, but you follow that trajectory. And then you go from data-driven insights, which is what you want to capture in this moment. The core idea behind data-driven insights is optimization. And then the image that I've got here is this little green button with improve. So to the point I'm making here, you can share the definition of data-driven insights, which you then force your audience to read. You can share a lot of charts and graphs showing how data-driven insights express themselves. But if you extract the key essence of what insights is trying to get to, which in this sense, in this generic kind of way, is optimization, and then if you translate optimization into a simple visual cue, in this case improvement with a green button, and then put a couple bullet points on your slide, which is improving patient identification, uh, you know, expanding precise reach for our audience, and better engagement, just three bullets. Then you can talk to it, talk with it, talk around it. They're listening to you, and they're not Obsessed with trying to figure out your slide, but just one takeaway. Any anyone want to toss in an idea? Want to do this exercise real quickly? Someone can toss out an idea about things that we talk about in print and broadcast and the topics today that start as a general concept, and then maybe we can quickly use that as an illustration. Any 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 volunteers? I'm sorry. Guaranteed performance. That's a good one, right? Because it ties into kind of our lot, right? So, all right, so top level, we're at a point in our presentation where we need to communicate to the audience the, 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 the key notion of guaranteed performance, right? So some of the old school ways of communicating guaranteed performance might be what? Citing a lot of numbers and metrics. Right? So, guaranteed performance is out terrific. What's the core idea that's behind that? I immediately thought, like, ROI. Right? ROI is, means what emotionally? So, if you promise ROI to somebody, how do they feel about it? Profitable, big, big, big. Right? So, the guaranteed performance is top line idea, that triggers the core element of that, which is return on investment. And then if you really think about return on investment, it's about showing the money. So the one way to look at that opportunity that you might have to present is you could have performance metrics in an Excel spreadsheet, and you can take a screenshot of that. And then you could write a red box around the very bottom of net benefit. So what your audience sees is a screenshot of an Excel spreadsheet with a little red box with numbers. That could be a guarantee of performance. That's not visually too compelling, and all of a sudden, People stop listening to you and they start squinting at the side with the self spreadsheet, right? Then you can take it a level further, which is what it actually means is ROI, which is return on investment for your client, right? Or for you, or for your colleague. So you could represent that 
visually in ways which is kind of maybe even a bunch of pie charts more visual, right? Here's the amount of money we, we spend, here's the benefit that we got, and then here's the delta. That would be good too, but then they're trying to stare at charts. <laughs> but the last one, which is your great point, which is money. So if you get to the point of guaranteed performance in your pitch or in your presentation, and you want to make an immediate impact on the audience, what about taking a screenshot of Tom Cruise screaming into a telephone with a little bubble, show me the money, right? Again, I'm just making it up. So the, the takeaway here is to keep it visual, keep it visceral, have fun with it, and don't shy away from the notion that you really need to entertain first and capture the emotional essence of your point. If you need to substantiate what you just said, you can maybe follow up. But it is a great idea, and again, if you see the TED Talks that really work, they usually have the nice animations and the simple points. Many of the, the, the super huge things that just need to show up, <laughs> they oftentimes have this one visual with a couple words, right? Like, quality. <laughs> and it used to kind of drive me nuts, which is like, come on, man, that, that, that's your pitch. But the beauty of it started to kind of sink in, which is shifting attention from slides to you, and then getting folks anchored in your idea that then you talk about. Slides don't do the happy lifting, you do. So lastly, close with a memorable call to action, right? So you dive in and you own the room and you feel comfortable and they're comfortable with you and you got trust and they're paying attention to you. And then you're pitching based on emotions and ideas and getting people focused on a story. You're really clear about who the hero is. The hero is a patient, the hero is a client, the hero is a tactic, the hero that you're trying to do. It's so clearly defined, they're into it. The villain is something interfering with that, the solution is what you're offering. And lastly, you want to close. So with the spirit of everything there, you're memorable, not your content. So they're going to remember you. If you're doing a business pitch, and this is like true, why do they choose you and not another agency? And if your client selecting an agency, what are some of the criteria you use? What bubbles up to the top? Clearly you want folks to be confident. The price needs to be right. But at the end of the day, the longer I've been in the business, and the more people I talk to, what's the take? We like, we like the teams, right? The teams seem to be tight with each other. They seem to know each other, like each other, and work well together. When we hire them, we work with them. We want to be with them. And in this increasingly commoditized age of buzzwords, where methodology and approaches and channels and capabilities become so complicated, so dependent, and so interchangeable, unique and standardized. At the end of the day, it's really about the personal impression that you make on your audience. It's really about you and what you bring to it. And it's really about what you give to them rather than what you take away. And I think that, that holds true. And part of that is being yourself, being unique, standing out, and, and taking a risk. Everyone's got a different style. I know people who are really, really introverted, and they're terrified of getting in front of their family, <laughs> letting go, let alone a whole audience full of people. But they're awesome. They're awesome. They got their own style. They take their shyness and their fear, and, and they build it up in terms of almost protecting themselves. But they've gone through it. And the audience sees their determination and sheer will, uh, the effort that they make. And through that struggle, they make that connection. Other people are the exact opposite. They're super extroverted. They can't wait to leap out there. And some of their problems are the opposite, where the introvert knows their stuff and goes through it, and you see the passion. The extrovert goes in and might even be distracted by the whole showmanship of it, 
train sometimes gets off the tracks in terms of content. We go off on tangents. There are like a radio that's playing loud music that isn't always in tune, right? But people like them too because they're into it and they see that passion and they're locked into it. So whichever kind of style you have to present in any which way you want to do it, whether you're introverted or extroverted, whether you're obsessed by details or like sailing on, on the top line, right? It doesn't really matter. As long as you can own the room, as long as you tell a story rather than dumping them full of data and make an emotional connection, and as long as you end with something that you really want them to do. There was a, a biz dev guy over at Inventive Health for years when I knew him. And he would always end a business pitch by saying, and now he would just say it, now it comes a time when I'm going to ask you for your business. And when he first did that, I thought that was the happiest thing I've ever heard in my whole life. I mean, it's obvious. We're here to pitch business, right? And in any type of context, you always have a goal or otherwise you're not doing it. So I'm sitting there, wow, okay. And then I saw that it works. And I saw that it actually adds clarity. And it gives the client something tangible and concrete. So sometimes you're there to win business. Sometimes you're there to train and infuse people. You act like as a coach. There's a million reasons why you pitch, why you present, why you engage folks. But to be crystal clear at the end of it, in terms of what you actually want them to do, is, I think, really, really important. It's oftentimes forgotten. You kind know, of like, you look, all right, all, that's it, thanks. You know, and you're kind of relieved that it's all over with. But then that defeats the purpose of why you even began and why people have spent quality time in their day and in their lives to sit on the button and watch you do it. So I break this down. I call it kind of landing on your feet with specific recommendations. If you're going to ask folks to do something, you want to keep it simple, immediate, and actionable, right? So you don't want to list 20 things that you do. So, okay, Salesforce, you know, at 8 a.m., you're going to check into the new portal. You're going to sign in. Uh, you need to change your credits to sign in. We've got new messaging that's waiting for you on the home page. We've got a host of downloadable materials that you can access for training. We would like you to check back in on what, you know what I mean? It's, it, it's just too much. But if you could have one key takeaway from why you presented to the sales force, the one or two or three things that will really boost them up, they'll remember you. And again, it's a small little thing that you ask folks to do. If you're in a business development situation, you just presented an enormous plan with tons of detail, right? But then when they walk away, how are they going to know how to act on that? And usually it's just as simple as the next step. We hope you loved us. Um, are you free Tuesday at 2 p.m. for a follow-up, right? You make it concrete. You make it easy on your audience to not only just take in all the information that you share, but to act immediately, very simply, and completely concretely on one, maybe two things. Meet at 2 o'clock to discuss the SOW, <laughs> the proposal. You're already assuming you won. Why not? Glad you loved it. Let's bake the proposal. Thanks, Salesforce. The new portal goes up Monday morning. Hope you like it. Log in. That's it. That's a link. <laughs> so stuff like that. Another one, just like I mentioned, limit to one, maybe two specific one. Ensure the results are memorable. So if you ask your client to meet for the proposal on Tuesday, they show up or they don't, right? It's a concrete action. When the sales force logs into the portal on Monday morning, you can see those who did and those who didn't, so you can react to it. By doing that, the conversation continues, right? If you don't ask them to do something specific, you have nothing to react to. And if you have nothing to react to, you have no basis for continuing the dialogue that you started. And then, lastly, in close, encourage closing the loop with that follow-up, which is, as I mentioned, it's about not ending this presentation, but using it as the open invitation to a relationship. And that's what we're doing. So, as I mentioned, own the room with an immediate impact, sustain that emotional, con emotional connection, close with that memorable thing, end where you began, reminding where you went, and ask them how you did. 
which is kind of a variation of the tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Because we're all marketers, right? It's about repetition, it's about communication, and it's about emotion. And lastly, when we put together a content strategy and when we talk about making an impact, specifically in BTC for our patients, whether we're using print or broadcast, social media, or any kind of technology, we have all these rules that we follow naturally. And kind of like an agency trying to brand itself, it's always so problematic, always good at branding other people. It's like these simple rules of human communication we often forget when we're working with our colleagues, we're trying to pitch business, right? You kind of throw those simple rules out the door. If you have a print ad, you have, you guys know it better than me, half a second, a second to make an impact. Broadcast TV, millions are spent on campaigns. You don't want people to get off the couch and grab the potato chips. You want to hold them. You've got a second or two, right? How, what kind of content do we talk about? We talk about it all day today. It's emotional content. Right? It's emotional impact, especially the patient audiences. And throughout the day, we've been talking about a creative and a content and a technological strategy that makes the most impact. And in ways, if you think about it, they're the exact same rules that I'm advocating you apply in your communications in a direct and very human kind of way. And I think that's another takeaway, which is, you know, apply to yourself in your communication with others the same rules that you apply when you recommend to clients and colleagues that we impact the millions of patients whose lives we transform pretty much each and every day with our full content. We educate, we empower, we facilitate treatment decisions. We make a real impact because we believe in the treatments that we espouse and we really think that we're you know, advancing public health. And in ways, you advance your career by adopting the same set of simple kind of rules to, to make that impact. So in that spirit of landing, uh, ask you guys how I did. Did I help shift your approach from data sharing to storytelling? Did I help with the slides? Are you guys going to maybe think twice about a slide with you know, 300 words on it next time? Will there be an effort to kind of crunch these maybe into like Three bullet, can you tell the same thing with three bullet points and maybe seven words? Can you trust yourself and the slides so that they're talking, they're listening to you and you're talking to them and the slides just act as little cohorts in your presentation? And then did I help convey the importance of asking people to do something as concretely and resolutely as possible? Because you know, I mean, again, in our world of DTC, communications, call to action. Learn more. Call your doctor. Download the support materials. Access the formulary finder tool. Register in the CRM. Same goes for what we do. So with that in mind, too, I'm all about hearing from you. So for concrete results, if you want to come up and talk to me, follow up. Uh, I'd love to chat, see how I can do better at this, seeing if this kind of experience provided value to your DTC experience today. We'd love to hear it. There's a feedback form that you fill out for all the presenters. Let us know if this had value for you, if you'd like to see it again. And then feel free and reach out to me direct as well for any kind of feedback. You know, I like doing this. I do kind of mentorship for folks giving presentations, I help with content. The DTC folks are interested in, if you guys like this kind of stuff, we can adapt workshops like this, and we can infuse them with, with more specificity based on that feedback. And that's it, I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>